Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're here to celebrate. My name is Catherine Stimson, and it is an enormous honor for me to celebrate the publication. It's a big book. <laughs> it takes me of a body in Fukushima. Now, Aiko, one of the has forbidden me to use the word masterpiece. And I always try to obey Echo. But I have to tell you, my friends, it is a masterpiece, an integration of dance and text and photography. It is a book of anguish and courage. It is a profound act of witnessing. The creators, Aiko Otaki, the dancer, William Johnston, the photographer and professor of history at Wesleyan University. And before we turn to these extraordinary creators, let me remind us of what Fukushima is. It's an ancient place. It is ancient in the sense of a deep natural history. Human beings, did not create 
the sea whose sound we heard. A brief timeline, if I can. The Meiji era, the restoration of the imperial government was in 1868. And Fukushima was a rebellious province for which it suffered politically and economically. It was a poor place. From 1939 to 1945, the Second World War, a subject to which we will surely return. In 1945, the US dropped two atomic bombs, the first in history, on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then post-war Japan would establish nuclear energy programs. Now this may seem like a footnote to this vast history, but it's not. In 1976, two young Japanese dancers, Eiko and Koma, immigrated to New York. And Eiko saw the changes over the years from her role as an immigrant. Interestingly, as a child, she had lived with her family for four years in a prefecture close to Fukushima. She was no stranger to it. And she had been born in 1952, barely a part of post-war Japan. And then 10 years ago, on March 11th, 2011, a triple disaster. A huge earthquake generating a tsunami flood of the Japanese coast that overwhelmed the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, a power plant totally unprepared for this. And Bill and Aiko in their book ask, in one rather sardonic moment, one would think that the country that had suffered from atomic warfare would know how to prepare its nuclear water for disaster. There were three meltdowns in the plant and th three hydrogen explosions. In August of 2011, Aiko went there with a friend and writes of this experience. She was utterly speechless. And then from 2014 to 2019, Aiko and Bill made five separate trips to Japan and Fukushima. And now this book, the fruits of these journeys. It gives us the feel, the look, even if we're imaginative, the smell of disaster. And it gives us the deep anguish and grief of disaster. But the book is echoes and bills. And let us turn to them and hear their voices, hear their voices. But one more opening image that takes up two pages in the front of the book. One more big image. I'm sure you can see it. On my left, on my left, are those really hideous concrete things. What are they there for? They're a man-made seascape. They remind me of the pillboxes that were put up on coasts when people were afraid of the invasions during World War II. These are to protect us from the sea. And on the right is the sea. You heard its sounds before. So dangerous, so life-giving. And you will see emerging from the water, 
a small naked figure in nature. Later we will see her dressed. She will be wearing her grandmother's kimonos and a red piece of material, which is at once flag and scarf. Red, the color associated with Shinto shrines. She will also be wearing pieces from loved friends. She will be wearing her mother's scarf. But now we see her in her desperate human vulnerability. I would now again, and this is a great honor for me because I so admire this book. I would like to turn to Aiko Otaki and Bill Johnson and ask my first question. And again, congratulations, Bill. Congratulations, Aiko. Am I reading these photographs correctly? What does the body of Aiko tell us about the body of Fukushima? And what does the body of Fukushima tell us about the world that we live in? I have to say, and you took the photograph, Bill. Aiko, you are that figure. It makes me weep when I look at it. Shakespeare man, poor, naked, for death. Aiko. I, thank you, Kate. Yeah. I, I'm kind of really impressed because when first time we talked about this event that you are kindly, you know, it was my idea to ask you because, you know, you and I have been friends for a long time, but we both are busy. So my life approach is ask your friend something important so we know each other more. And that's exactly how you've been dealing with this. So when you picked this page, particularly up, I was so touched because I had a long hesitation to bring this naked photo into a book. You know, because I'm not from Fukushima, I'm not from the sea, I'm not a mermaid, but it's only one time I became completely naked. And that, we took, you know, probably hundreds of photos being naked. But this me small enough, and me not frontal naked, but naked in a way, no protection. And that's, for me, for someone who had been <laughs> performing very long time, uh, naked without any costume, a long time with coma, um, it was important to, to, when I saw this particular photo, something clicked in me and I said, perhaps I can put it in a book. I think Bill was very surprised when I, I added this photo to a selection of our commonly, you know, our back and forth selection of the photos, which was itself was not an easy task. But I, what you just said about combination between 2019 seashore which is kind of hiding the sea, kind of a shore, to this naked body into these waves of ocean. I really appreciated what you said. Thank you, Bill. You took the photo. What? <laughs> you stood there with a long lens and you took the photo. Were you surprised by it and surprised by the contrast? And you deliberately in the book set it up with in the contrast with those cement hunks didn't you <laughs> actually it was the designers who who put that together but i was delighted with the way they did that um so first of all let me just say you know thank you so much for the the, the very generous introduction there and and echo yes um i was surprised that you chose that because of the many images we've, we've taken and, and we went back and forth over which images to um, consider for inclusion um, we always had said well probably not for the naked photos and I was fine with that because we had plenty of other things to work with. But I think, you know, it, it really encapsulates so much, as, as, as Kate has pointed out here, so much of what we're attempting to do in this book. And Kate, you, you asked the question, you know, are you reading the images correctly? And in, in all of the modifiers you used there, um, I would just want to say a, a very close friend of mine, um, Victoria Pitts Taylor, who's the um, head of the uh, Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies program here at Wesleyan. 
um, came to um, Eco's performance in which she projected many of these images. And she said almost exactly the same thing that you did. The, 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 the kind of anguish, the, the, the mourning, the, the feelings that you had, had uh, mentioned were the exact same feelings that, that she said that she had in, in looking at those images. Um, so yes, thank you. Um, well, I would, I think since you mentioned the designers, let's give credit to them to yes. Kara Bazell and Lucinda Hitchcock, yes. Yes. because it is a beautifully designed book. And if this was their idea to make that juxtaposition, it was one of many ideas that made the book even more anguishing and gave us an even greater sense of the depth of the sorrow the two of you were exploring. Uh, I actually join you in thanking them because I'm somewhat a control freak. I have been performing. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> directing uh, no, no. pieces, right? So, and I'm so used to having an argument in the process because Koma and I and me and my collaborators, we argue to get a better result, right? Not for the argument, for the argument's sake. So I think the designer, they're wonderful people, but I might have surprised them a little bit because we really collaborated. They were very open to show the ideas and several different ideas. So we can really find ways to think about together. And so this is not a coffee table book with authority attached. This is an artist book. The only authors in this book is Bill and I, even the stories are of the much more different people, right? So the designers open to our notion and my hesitation, I often quoted myself many times saying, we don't want to alienate. We don't want to make the people of Fukushima to feel their stories being taken away from them. It was important for me to share this book and that they can feel it, it is their book as well as my and Bill's book. It is for the book who cares about the environment, who cares about history, who cares about how we can all participate in witnessing history. And I think the designer team really responded in many of my uh, and Bill's um, feedback. So it was a very much a collaboration. This whole project has been a collaboration in many different ways. But well, that I, I wanted to ask you both. Uh, you have a note on your collaboration at the end of the book. Yes. <laughs> but, you've, <laughs> but you've opened up two sorts of collaboration. One is the two of your old friends as well. Yeah. You've worked together at Wesleyan. Bill is not only a professor of history, but of public health. And, but just now you opened up a second idea of collaboration is how did you collaborate with the people of Fukushima, especially since haven't many of them been sent away from these irradiated areas. How did you go in in 19, in 2014? How did you, well, actually what Eiko writes is that she came back to the United States and said to Bill, you have to be the photographer. Is that true? Right. <clears throat> All right. And then this, but how did you, again, part of the book describes that this is, the people were evacuated. It was irradiated. And one of the scandals I read in the book was the people were sometimes permitted to come back too soon. Or forced. Or forced. There was a denial. There was a denial of the scandal. Right. So how did the two of you, an American professor, a Japanese native, how did the two of you gain the trust of a traumatized population? I, I, would, I would want to say that it, it goes back to the beginning of our collaboration, which actually is in teaching courses about the atomic bombings of Japan, which you very kindly mentioned there, um, that that was a key issue for both of us. And, and that's how we got to know each other. Um, I was asked to join ECO in teaching uh, courses in which we would integrate performance with, you know, in my case, history um, in the classroom. And I was game to doing that. And we ended up creating a seminar in which we integrated performance with the study of the history of the science of the atomic bombings 
as well as the, the various historical issues that led to the world, the war itself, and then the, the, the creation and, and, and dropping of the atomic bombs. And, I, and both of us had become very sensitive to the issues that the victims of the atomic bombings um, faced. Eiko became a very close friend with uh, Hayashi Kyoko, Kyoko Hayashi, who was one of the great uh, writers, um, survivor of Nagasaki, and who wrote about her experiences there. And, I, and at least in the back of my mind and my feeling were the experiences of what people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, were when thinking about the experiences of the people in Fukushima. Um, I had seen a, um, a poster I, in a, at a, a monastery where I, I go to um, in Japan, and it said, do not discriminate against those who suffered hibaksha, the people who had suffered basically exposure to the uh, nuclear um, disaster, but it's basically the same word as the people who experienced the atomic bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. So Kate, you know, you actually are part of this from the day, day one. Remember we met when you were working in a Makasa Foundation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Commander, you were very surprised to have gotten the fellowship. And it took us a few years when we really wanted to find what we wanted to do differently. But meantime, already, you know, 9 11 was approaching. So, with that thinking, how do I take in this incredible recognition and expectation to work in a current society and being a contemporary artist who grapple with the issues? I saw 9 11 happen exactly as I'm sitting right now. I'm sitting on my dining table. In know, New York City. In New, New York, York City. City, yes, I'm on the 42nd uh, Street on 29th floor. So I'm actually seeing the Trade Center. And I saw the two towers fall from here. And a few months later, I have talked to you, and you helped me to go to NYU Gallatin Graduate School. And it's a big shift for me. I'm a proud dropout, as you always know. <laughs> and I really needed to study, this study, something I thought as being a Japanese. I thought compared to American standard, you know, level of knowledge. I thought I know about atomic bomb. I know about, you know, violence because Japan was perpetuator. And it's in my body, it's very deep, you know, growing up knowing those things, right? But when I saw 9-11, and because I had a relationship with the building, I would command I had a residency there a year before. So really felt, oh, this, this really is, I am a part of American society's system. And how do I find a way to keep working, recognize the system, be a part of the system in a way we can change it, even by little by little, if not more radically, which I was hoping when I was young. So with that, you know, I came to, and I think you, you and my friendship kind of blossomed because I was often in NYU's neighborhood taking my own designed classes because there was no class on atomic bomb, atomic bomb literature. I had to design my own class. And when I was done with it, it was the time I met Bill. And on the first meeting, he proposed, because I was writing my thesis, and he knew already Ekan Dokuma's work. So he proposed, why don't we teach together? So it was wonderful for me, because I was literally seeking the ways how I can meet, relate, affect, be affected by the people, to the people, rather than just only being on stage and not talking and dancing. I'm very proud to be a performing artist, but it was just necessary for me to branch out. And you helped me doing this. Well, it was my privilege. I'm, I'm delighted I could help you <laughs> in any small way, I'm delighted. <laughs> so I did, and you know, I, did, I translated Kyoko Hayashi's book, Nabila and I were teaching, and then, you know, Commander, I became extremely busy with our retrospective. And right in the middle of retrospective, where we were looking 40 some years of our own history, you know, looking at every video and every photo, then March 11, 2011 happened. You know, well, there is that gap. 
of 10 years between 9-11 to March 11. And it is again, <sighs> what do I do? Well, I think one of the things you mean when you look at 9-11, March of 2011, and here we are in 2021, how do we measure disasters? And in your book, and Bill, talk about, about this. You talk about, I'm not, these are not your exact words, little disasters, slow disasters, little disasters and huge disasters. And doesn't disaster have a variety of timescales? And climate change is a disaster on a huge timescale. The creation of atomic energy with all that that's meant is a disaster on a comparatively short time scale. If the first bombs were dropped in 45, though there were years of preparation for it. And I think, in, in, and how do you do this? Because this book and your work, your dances, your thinking, Bill, your photograph, and how do you take to your students? How do you take to me? How do you take to the people in this webinar? And ask us all to look at long, slow rolling disasters and short disasters. And who has created this disaster? You are really asking us to look at the meaning of disaster and what is our human responsibility. Now, I don't know who was responsible for the earthquake and the tsunami. You do know who was responsible for the lack of preparation at the power plant. But how do you do it? How do you live with these disasters and all their scales and ask people to think about them as well? as our prophets and our witnesses. How do you do this and what resistance do you get? I mean, do you get people just saying, oh, don't be scaredy cats? What, <laughs> what happens, Bill, when you, and Aiko, when you want people to have the courage to confront disasters? Because if we don't, they will continue. What do you do with our resistance to it? Kate, thank you for that wonderful question. And, and you know, it goes back, I, I think, in many ways to my long personal history as well, in which I grew up without a very clear awareness, awareness of history. I, you know, I, I grew up you know, in a place in the middle of Wyoming um, and you know, very little sense really of place. I mean, although I, I had a very strong sense of the indigenous peoples who had lived there and, and felt that it was a disaster that it had been stolen from them. And that, that was my ancestors, quite literally, um, who had perpetrated that. But it was then I went into international relations and realized I couldn't understand what was going on in the world around me without knowing that history. And that got me to trying to study history more and thinking of, you know, as the, the great um, uh, historian, um, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm forgetting his name right now, uh, uh, Bernard Fredel, uh, Brodel, Fernand Brodel, um, talks about long durée and the disasters as such we need to think about as long durée and the other part of them is that we're all interconnected with these things and looking very carefully at interconnections and stepping away from for example national identity because with nuclear issues you know we tend to think in the United States of oh the nuclear bomb it was this sort of miracle that we were able to put together the Manhattan project and it ended the war that's that's the narrative that we put together without thinking through what is the whole history of of nuclear um, power and how did it get put together it's a global history including Japanese scientists um, and and in the meantime it's the rise of capitalism and the um, the ever-growing need for, for you know, more money to create more stuff for more consumption. And nuclear power answers one of these uh, uh, um, uh, questions about you know, how do we increase our, our um, accessibility to power when so many of the things that, that, that you know, people are trying to sell us require some kind of energy to make them work. Um, and so the, it's this combination of, of nuclear weapons, but then the realization quite quickly that, that they could use 
um, nuclear power to create energy as well. But one of the stories that doesn't get told there, in, in particular with regard to um, the Japanese case, is that it was coming out of Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace project. And behind Atoms for Peace was the idea that if we persuade people that we should be um, building nuclear power plants for peaceful um, energy, at the same time, those power plants are actually creating plutonium, which, hey, we also have bomb uh, material that's coming out of Atoms for Peace. And Japan was very quickly integrated into this during the post-war period um, with the uh, perspective that the Japanese were uh, you know, as, as anti-communist as we were, um, and that they would not betray us and, and be giving uh, nuclear secrets away to our enemies um, and that we could trust them in building these um, uh, power plants. And then it became a project for um, among many, uh, but it was people primarily on the political right um, in Japan who pushed nuclear power as a way of um, uh, uh, you know, creating this sort of infinitely cheap and infinitely accessible source of energy without looking at the dangers and the, the problems of nuclear waste. Um, so in trying to persuade people to think about these things, I try to get them to think long term and over many different dimensions. Um, and of course, it's not easy and it's very complex. You know, I sat next to a lawyer for the nuclear um, industry at one point on an airplane. I think she regretted sitting next to me after we landed because <laughs> I just kept going from one point to the next and, and she would try to counter my arguments. And I said, well, but in the long run, what do we do with nuclear waste? And she goes like, yeah, you got a point there. We really don't have any uh, solution to that yet. Um, but that, you bring that up two questions. Eiko, when you were, before you left Japan as a, as an immigrant to America, you were a radical student. And you and Coma and your radical colleagues, before you were dropouts, um, you must have been aware of the history that Bill has just given us. Yes, uh, to the degree. Uh, but also going back to your first question, why, and you know, this duet with Bill had started, mm -hmm. is also because I am no longer that radical student as I was, but I wanted to be, and I still trying to be a radical being in a way of questioning, in a way of learning, right? Not in a way of assumed responsibilities and just putting yourself into the assumed productivity. So that desire has always been very strong. I'm no longer the name on the Radical Revolution Army, but I wanted to be the kind of artist that is the individual thinker, the individual doer, right? So as you can already tell from the way Bill had answered you, I wasn't picking my best friend to go to Fukushima with. I mean, he happened to be a good friend because we were already teaching together. But I picked someone who don't come in with a big ring of aura of a well-known photographer. I wanted to be work with someone that I can have many, 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 many meals together. I wanted to work with someone who, with whom we don't fight, whose work this is. It's a collaborative work we do together and I could trust. Three, it's important he's a scholar on Japanese history and science in society. So in that sense, I congratulate myself, which I seldom do, is to have first, very fast sort of, oh, I want to go back to Fukushima. Oh, I need a photographer. Oh, let's call Bill. But that's very much feeding into my knowledge about who he is. And sure enough, think about who would come with me five times to Fukushima on their own money. I mean, I, you know, I did the first part of it as a project, but ever since we've been really being totally even paying our way. And then in a way of sharing every photo that I'm in, we share. I never paid him a penny. We go on this process and he teaches me all the time. He teaches me how to look at a photograph. He teaches me what that little stone in a in the temple says, because I can't read this like all the ancient wording, he can. So, and then he can also be so friendly with the people there 
Yeah, first ask question was the first time we went to there, we really couldn't see the people who are living in that area that are very uh, radically affected because they had to leave. So we basically go to this empty land. But then soon there are workers who are there during the day, which is outsiders, right? And we are being somewhat criticized, somewhat ridiculed, somewhat welcomed, depending on whom we talk. It's only our last visit in 2019, I think we became comfortable enough that we've been working on this some time. So I was not shy to speak with the people who came back or to speak with the people who lived right outside of the danger zone because the danger zone, the lining of danger zone is nothing but man-made zone, zone, right? It's not really, it's not outside outside of the zone is immediately not dangerous. It's still so, a it's still a dangerous place, isn't it? But I mean again, if you are 18 years old or you are like 68 years old, the 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 measurement of the danger to your life, you know, you measure differently. You know what you, you talked about the two of you going back for five times. Yes. A long trip, a difficult trip, a trip into trauma. You know, there's a video I'd like our webinar listeners to see, and that's the changes you saw in an area of Fukushima called Yabermachi. And could you just, because it was a disaster to begin with, and it's still a very dangerous place, a broken place, but you saw and I know, Bill, you're a modest historian and you're not going to look at, <laughs> you're not going to make terrible, grandiose statements about historical change. But can we show our audience the video that shows the changes you saw in one part of Fukushima? This is one very small place, which literally means broken town. Broken town? Yes. Yabure Machi. So Yabure is to break Machi as time. Was it called that before the disasters? Yes, yes. that's an ancient name. That piano, that's a piano I see there. Yes. The shocking part was this is already 2014, nearly three years after the disaster. So the only reason it has not been cleaned up then was because of radiation. And this is right directly outside of the house, all tsunami steps. And the only road has been built very quickly because they need a road, you know, to do the transportation to the power plant. We went up back in the summer, and of course, green was astounding, right? Because we were there in the winter. But nobody came back. Nobody could come back. Not even cleaning has been done. This was most astounding to me because I'm a Japanese person who grew up in Japan. Usually, Japanese person very fast going to the typhoon disaster place. You know, they clean up, but not in this place. So that really showed me. Eiko, are those your grandmother's kimonos? Yes. Yes. Everything I wore is my grandmother's. And this will explain to you why this two years later, we were even more shocked. The very house we shot two times were gone. So that between 2014, 2016 is a big changeover into the way the government really came in and tried to do. And this is the most recent trip. Again in the winter, 2019, shortly before. Pandemic made it impossible for us to go back. And you know, originally I thought about, oh, we just go to the stations because I was on the process of, in the process of making a solo piece that I perform in a station. And I wanted to compare contrast between this nobody station, no, to the, no train, no people station in Fukushima to Philadelphia station. But when we went to this particular house, 
which was not a station, it's just people's house. I think when something really shifted in my objectives of going to Fukushima, it wasn't just snatching the picture in a deserted station because it's picture rescue, it's because it's shocking. Really, I saw that nobody is there and ancestors remains including their kimonos and their futons and their household items were there. And I think this, this place really made me to start this whole idea of a body in places. So something I really learned in Fukushima is when you say Fukushima, people think about one thing. Oh, it's a Fukushima, nuclear disaster. There are so many different Fukushimas within Fukushima, within the same same area, there's a different history. And that it's important for me to be in the place with a scholar, historian, photographer, to really feel this particular place is different from that particular place, but it is all comprise the larger experience, which is Fukushima. Uh, before we go to the Q&A, can I ask you both, if you're both realists about the world, is there ever a chance that this will be made Fukushima into a tourist site after, after it's uh, cleaned up a little bit more, which is going to take, what, 40 more years? Um, in some ways, it's becoming a tourist site, but I, I think of it <gasps> more as almost um, disaster pornography. Um, it's and and there's you know plans for for making this sort of a theme park kind of places even which I just find pretty abhorrent um, and in many ways that it overlooks the the long term reasons for why this happened the complicity of of TEPCO and the Japanese government uh, in allowing this to happen um, uh, I I think that uh, you know there are parts of Fukushima which already are are really quite safe and beautiful, and I hope people do start to go to visit them more. Um, they don't know how long it's going to take to actually um, uh, decommission the, the reactor, so it's it's going to be much longer than than sixty eighty years, I think. And anything can happen during this process called decommissioning, you know, because Japan is earthquake bound, Japan is tsunami bound. So the process planning is not at all safe and secure. So that's important, right? And also, however, there are enough serious young people now visiting because now you can actually visit. And there are sort of like a little tours of learning this disaster. Two of my students that I taught in Tokyo University independently went back, bringing all my photo carriers and they went to every site that Bill and I took photographs. And those are serious effort of learning. And you know, they do that in a limited amount of the time, you know, not really stay in the area long time. And and yes, and thank you for saying that, Eiko, because there are many people who are visiting for all the right reasons and going to, for example, the village of Odaka, where the the, the great writer Yumiri um, lives and has created a theater. And it, they're really working there to revive the place and, and give it, you know, they they know that they can't um, revive the community as it was so they know that they have to create a new community and they're very much in the process of doing that and they're welcoming people from the outside whenever it's possible to engage with them. I'm still a little haunted by the question of the theme park but Eiko, Bill, it's 6 45 mm -hmm. and we've got a couple of marvelous questions, very suggestive and interesting questions. For 10 minutes I'm going to turn the mic over to Jay Wakeman again, who will do the Q and A's and either of you can take them as you will. And then at 6.55, we'll come back for some final words from, the two, from Bill and from ACO. But Jay, you are now the moderator of the Q and A. We've got a good question from Karen Shimakawa. Oh yeah, uh, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Karen. <laughs> okay. Uh, she came, she, I have to say, with us. last one, last trip. She, she flew from New York to join us in Fukushima for good reason. <laughs> and it was a pleasure to have her with us. She really pushed us in new directions. 
So Karen is asking, uh, she writes a couple of questions. Could you both talk a bit about the relationship between live dance performance, performance documentation, and photographic art? What do you hope this book will do in terms of that relationship? And the second question, uh, do you see this as one long performance project or a series of discrete performances? For well, second question, I think it's both because there is no divide, dividing line, right? So Airbody in Places is a project. So you can see it as a project, but I can only be showing in front of the people the live performance one time, one place, one night at a time. But I have kind of been thinking, and this is also something I wanted to ask Kate, and maybe we might not have time, but I can bother her another time is, how was a performing artist? How can I be not just stuck with one particular show that I'm being seen? Could I write about it? Could I talk about it? Could I show other things I do? Could I share the places I have gone to? Could I show the people to another people that I feel committed to? And can I use my performance body as a conduit between places, between people, between different times? Can I also bring knowledge, even though I don't illustrate knowledge? So those are have been my very important questions. And I think that is one of the reasons why I have made a commitment to this, this project that I work in Fukushima time to time. But Eiko, your body is also an archive. Oh, because I'm now old enough here. <laughs> well, no, you're eternally young, but you do that. <laughs> <laughs> But what was the second part of Karen's question? Well, because the, the it was link like... between live dance documentation and photo art. Um, and I, I would want to address that very briefly um, in, in, in saying that, so when, when Aiko and I went there, it wasn't a matter of Aiko performing for me as a photographer. She wasn't my subject as, as such. Rather, we're there to express this place through her performances. And at least in my own thinking, the photographs themselves, the images that one can see in the book or in other um, venues, um, such as when Aiko shows them in videos, that the photos themselves are the performance um, from that place. And this is a notion I, I learned from Bill, but somehow I think I must have known it you know, because I have not only created performances, I also created installations and exhibitions. So why don't I not believe it, even in the installation, even in this book? In this book, people can have it in their home and they can open, and anytime they can open, I'm there. Mm. And for that moment, I hope it is performative. And Bill is also there. I'm just thinking of the way that photograph of the concrete seascape is framed so that what when this book is in homes and libraries and people are holding it and i think you cannot help but admire it and learn from it that you were in the presence not only of the animation of your own imagination you're in the presence of a photographer's eye using modern technology good technology and in the presence of an utterly brilliant body together with some text to help you through it. This book will live for you. I swear this book will live for you. Thank you. Is there, there was a second question, wasn't there, Jay? There's another question from Ron Jensen, and it's actually a question for Bill. Said your photography of Ego's performances are amazingly expressive and beautiful. I wonder what in your experience as a photographer prepared you for this particular work? Um, so I really appreciate this question. And um, the, the very short part of it is, is um, Pam Tatchy, who is the former director of the Center for the Arts here at Wesleyan, had asked me to shoot performances a number of times. And so I had, had done some of that work. But really, as a photographer, I thought of myself and worked as a landscape photographer using large format cameras, starting with a four by five inch, four by five inch negative, um, working up to a 12 by 20 inch negative. 
um, 8 by 10, 11 by 14, 12 by 20. And of course, when you're shooting a large photograph that size with a negative, um, especially when you're working with, you know, even, you know, 8 by 10 or, or 11 by 14, um, you, you, you open up the shutter one time and you've just spent about eight to $12 uh, for just the price of the negative, not to mention the, the length of time it goes into developing, et cetera, et cetera, processing the, the negatives. So it, it forces a photographer to shoot very carefully and meaning you have to compose it with great care every time. And I took that as a habit um, of shooting you know, trying to compose a good photograph um, every time. And then with Aiko's expressiveness, the expressiveness of her, of her body, as Kate puts it, um, it, it, it's, it, it she was also was in dialogue with this place. And so it was that combination of, of my, you know, wanting to really get the place here, uh, uh, express it in a, in a landscape photography, but it's a landscape photograph with a performance uh, unfolding in it. Um, I think to thank you, Bill, but Jay, if I can collaborate with you on this, didn't Ron also ask a question about? There's another one. He's got, uh, I'm curious about the matter of collaboration with the people of Fukushima. In what sense is that real? I don't recall seeing any of those people in the book, for example, only the ruinous remains, their homes and businesses. Um, if I could say that again, very briefly, just to go back to my landscape photography, I, I, I loved going to places where people weren't overtly visible, but it was always an engagement with what people had done in that place and making it clear that here's the traces of where they had been. Yeah, and also, yes, so there are there are houses, there are fields where people used to have crops, but now they can't, right? So there are it's not just a wild nature. It's where the people had been living and that they had to evacuate. But also, like first three, four trips, I think, I was very hesitant. I don't want to just, like, I'm not an interviewer. I'm not a journalist. I'm there as an artist. And it's, sometimes it's hard for people to understand or it's hard for me to explain how, what is the product. I'm, I'm not there for product-based ways. So it took me some time to really find the people who are there intentionally, who are there so willing to talk to us. And you know, through the web of the people we get to meet, we finally came to the occasion where I'm no longer hesitant to open up and, and vice versa. And I think that really took us several visits and several years how the people begin to come back and they, each of them has different reasons to come back. Did you meet any overt hostility, government hostility, hostility from? Well, sometimes we were questioned by police uh, because I was changing the clothes on the street, you know, that nobody seems to be there or the sudden police appears. Uh, <laughs> you know, the people who are working there, sometimes they did you know, when they were drunk because they were staying in the same hotel, you know, they would challenge us saying, oh, you are only here like visiting. You're not here. You're not stuck the way we are here stuck. And that's a very legitimate criticism. And I accepted it. And, but that's, that's what it is. We are visiting. We are not from Fukushima. And why do we visit? Because we think what Fukushima present is absolutely serious and absolutely important for other people who are not in Fukushima. And otherwise I couldn't go. So I think that's my relationship and my history. Um, and it will change over time because you know Fukushima is also changing and the world is also changing. The book will be sent to Fukushima, won't it? Oh yes, I will be bringing the book to, uh, to the people. Jay, is that our questions? Because they were wonderful questions. Yeah have a lot more, but I'm mindful of time. You want one more question? Then we will, I will shorten the wrap up. And is there one more question? Uh, there are several and it's kind of like Solomon here. Um, I don't know which one to choose. Uh, how about, uh, this is from Maggie Gunderson. 
to us, your work represents how fragile we as a species are physically and how strong we are spiritually. Did it feel that way to you as you made these visits? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's from Arnie and Arnie, thank you so much for attending. Oh. Um, yes, for me personally, absolutely. Because I am a practicing Zen Buddhist um, and I bring to this a, a compulsion for witnessing. For me, it's absolutely important that we witness disasters, that we are aware of them and that we keep this awareness front and center while at the same time accepting the pain that's within them um, and not letting it overwhelm us because if we do then then we we're helpless um, so it's that combination of things i mean and, and it's also that combination of things which to me contributes to trying to create something beautiful out of something which is really terrible i thank you for that answer bill they were great questions and i speak for all of us when i say we're coming to the end but please be in touch with Skirball, be in touch with this book. We're going to show one last image, which I think fits in with the theme of the questions and what Bill just said. And then I will ask Aiko and Bill to say one last word. I was going to quote from Adrian Rich's famous poem called Power about Marie Curie discovering radium and denying her wounds denying she had radiation sickness, denying that her wounds came from the same source as her power. And I think this book asks us not to be Marie Curie's, not to deny the wounds that are the consequences of our power. But very quickly, the last image, and then we will turn with our gratitude, our absolute gratitude to Echo and to Bill for their last word. Here is the body again, the body we saw coming from the sea. The sea is in the distance. The body is half clothed. The road is rough. The body is surrounded by debris of our civilization and by nature. Together, and the body is teaching us how to live or not live with both. And the sea beyond us, I would say, is that we must acknowledge the powers that surround us, acknowledge our own powers, and discard the destructive ones. But one of our great powers is to dance and to visualize, to make art. And as Echo and Bill have told us, to make art is both our conscience and our saving grace. Thank you, Jay. And now, Bill, your last word of saving grace. And Echo, your last word of saving grace. And my last word before you speak is of gratitude to you for bringing us art that is both conscience and a saving grace. Bill, your last word about this, then echo, then we must all say good night. Thank you, Kate. And, and, and I especially want to express my own gratitude to you, Echo J and, and Skirball for allowing us to do this to, and to everybody who's come, thank you so much. And the one thing I would want to emphasize is that for me, this is an act of witnessing and remembering. And I would ask that we continue to make those goals in our lives all the time, um, in whatever ways they can. April? Yes, I have already more than one, so I go first. Um, sorry about this. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, we dedicated this book to Sam Mira and Kyoko Hayashi, very close friend of ours. Both have died, leaving us. And it's important for me, as I felt in Fukushima, we continue to relate, we continue to hear friends, the people whose lives are no longer with us. And it is the kind of communication and dialogue I need to continue as much as to the people much younger. And I think this book is an attempt. And I also just want to acknowledge 
Last week, I'm sorry, last week, my very dear friend and the teacher Anna Halbring passed away. And on the day, I was literally writing her little, my signature and thank you note on the first page of the book and shipped. It was the day she died. So I hope that I was still communicating and I will continue to communicate and hear her thoughts. And this is what I wrote in the end of the book with, along with many thank yous. I have been particularly inspired by the humility and the bravery of Kazuo Ono and Anna Harpurin. Both are my dear teachers and they danced everywhere possible. So I'm not the first one to go further away to dance. There are many, many dance artists who have done that. And I'm just sitting and walking and dancing on that line of amazing artists who are before us. Me and before us. Thank you. Thank you. May the arts be blessed. Thank you. May the blessed dead guide us. May we go out into the night now or the day, wherever we are, and act with conscience and act as witnesses, and do not forget what we've been brought by these two artists in all their efforts and in all their persistence that art will be with us. Thank you, Jay. And thank you all of you who've been with us. Uh, we have been together and let us all celebrate the publication of this beautiful and important book. Good night all.